Hello, everyone. My guest today is Emily Cushman. She's the founder and CEO of a company called Kira Talent. She founded the company in 2012, and since launching the company, she's been named the HSBC Women, uh, lead, Woman Leader of Tomorrow and one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women. Emily, are you ready to take us to the top? Yes. All right. Tell us about the company. What's Kira Talent do, and how do you make money? All right, so Kira Talent is the supplemental application platform for universities. So what that means is when you apply online, normally you will put in your grades and your test scores. We do everything else. So things like the essay, uh, timed video interviews, timed written assessments, portfolio elements, really things that look into more who you are as a person, not just how you did on some test. Mm -hmm. We work with uh, universities primarily, uh, mostly graduates as opposed to undergraduate, and uh, mostly professional programs like business schools, med schools, health sciences and engineering. And how I'm trying to remember, unfortunately, I'm too far removed from when I went through my college application. I'm trying to remember how these things were processed before you. So what are you competing with? What's the legacy solution? So, I mean, the legacy solution, even when I went to school, which wasn't that long ago, was a paper-based system where you actually had to mail in an application. Uh, Since then, that's been brought online. So usually now you'll go to a school's website, you'll click apply now, and then you kind of just fill out or upload a bunch of forms. So we've turned this into more of an experience that's a lot nicer for the applicant and it includes a lot more of this, you know, rich multimedia content that gets to know who you are as a person. And, and are you charging the applicants or the schools? We sell to the schools directly. So we sell to the university admissions team. Okay. And give me a general sense of like the different packages you offer and what's maybe the average admissions team will pay uh, for this tool. Yeah, so pretty average is we'll get a program, maybe it's an MBA program or a master's in finance, uh, about a thousand applicants, and they'll pay about 20 grand, and that's an annual contract value. Got it. So 20 grand, and the limiting factor on that is you can accept about a thousand applicants via this over the next, over the year. Yeah, that's pretty standard. Okay, very good. And so um, are, are most of the programs that you're working with kind of these online only universities, or no, you work with a lot of kind of brick and mortar ones as well? Uh, we actually work with all brick and mortar universities. <laughs> so okay, good. Uh, I think we only have maybe one online program, but for the most part, these are schools. These are schools like U of T, you know, Yale, Notre Dame, and you know, they want more out of their application. They've seen that test scores are not indicative of success. So they're trying to look at other factors that, you know, can allow them to see who's actually going to be successful once they show up on campus and once they graduate and go to get a job. And walk me, I want to get more of the backstory here and put this on a timeline, but how many campuses have you scaled to today? 300. Oh, 300. Great. And, and then again, put that on a timeline. When did you launch? So we started the company in 2012. So it's been six years. Now the first year and a half that we were in business, we actually sold to corporations. So oh. we've got about 40 corporations on board, including names like Coca-Cola or Sun Life in Canada. Um, so some big names, but we just found this sweet spot in higher ed. And you know, there was really no one doing this at the time. So we saw that as our blue ocean and we just doubled down and became an EdTech company. So really since EdTech was like 2014. Yeah, I was just saying, if you have 300 customers paying that ACV you just mentioned, I think my math, that comes out to about 500 grand a month or something like that. Is that accurate? Pretty close. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a big moment for you to realize I need to shift from these big logos to just doing and doubling down on, on schools, essentially. What was that moment? How did you know and identify that as a sweet spot? Uh, you know what? You know, we had been selling into corporate for a while and we kept coming up. And this is actually back when we were just a timed video interview player. So that was our original product. Uh, that we launched to market. So we weren't always the full full supplemental. We were just the one piece, which was timed video. And, you know, as we sold that into corporate, we started coming against the same players over and over and it almost became commoditized really fast. And then on the side, you know, we had these schools that were actually coming to us and they were saying, Hey, you know, we we want to incorporate like a video essay. And this is kind of like that. It's like an asynchronous video platform. So we had, you know, U of T, they were the first school that came to us. And, you know, Canadian business school landscape is pretty competitive. So, of course, once we got U of T, you know, Ivy and Queens were next in line. And after a couple months, we just thought, you know what, we're banging our heads against the wall trying to compete against these other commoditized video products. When over here, we literally have, you know, EdTech clients coming to us and, you know, they're signing up front on three-year contracts. They're a pleasure to deal with and they're actually using our full product. You know, they're not saying, oh, we want to run some pilot. <laughs> Or, oh, we want to, you know, just use this piece over here. They're using our full product right away in, you know, they, they kind of just, they, they get it. So uh, it was a, it was a pretty clear decision, I'd say. Are they paying the three-month contract value all up front? So 20, 40, 60 grand all up front or no? They pay annually? No, no, no. They'll pay annual, like annual up front. But I mean, when we were selling it to corporate, we had to like fight tooth and nail. It was, well, what if we just pay you, you know, 10% now and... Yeah. 
you know, like, no. It's a headache, total headache. Yeah. Well, well, okay, so 2015, you launched, uh, you get, sorry, 20, I think, yeah, 2012, you get started on this. Have you decided to bootstrap or raise capital? So we ended up raising a bunch of capital. Uh, we did our first round, uh, well, we did a couple rounds. We did a, an angel round of 300,000. We did a seed round of just over 2 million. And then uh, we actually had a leadership change. So our investors brought in a CEO to come in and run the company for a couple of years. And in that time, we had a different CEO here. There was another six million put into the business. Okay. So just over eight million in total uh, that we had raised. Uh, however, the CEO did not work out. So he, uh, we had him exit the business. Uh, I came back at the end of 2016, and at that point, we made the decision to become more of a profitable company. So now we're operating break even. We'll turn to profitability within the next uh, couple months, and it's a whole different way of operating. Did you actually leave the company, or you just assumed like a COO role or something while he was running it? Yeah. Yeah, assumed a different role, kind of just bounced around different departments, uh, traveled a lot. <laughs> why, why did, so this is, a, by the way, this happens all the time and nobody talks about it. So I'm hoping that we can have a great conversation here and pull some learnings out. Why, when you're only two or three years old, do the investors say, I imagine they probably said something like, we're only giving you this money if you bring in this CEO. Why do they feel that? Yeah, I mean, a couple of reasons. I mean, I think the main reason was that myself and my co-founder, we were, you know, 19 and 21 when we started the business and first time entrepreneurs uh, in Canada. <laughs> and I think investors said, you know what, uh, we, we want someone older and experienced who's done this before, before we put in this type of check size. So, you know, step aside and you can learn from this person and go from there. So why, why'd you roll over? Why not say, you know what, screw you, we don't need the money. <laughs> Um, you know what? I mean, I think at the time, and it's funny because it, it wasn't that long ago, but it was still, you know, five or six years ago. And in Toronto, the the landscape was still, uh, it was still early. So we started at a time where accelerators were very new and there weren't that many here. And, you know, there were not a lot of companies that were getting angel and seed funding. So we were one of the few. And to be honest, like we just didn't have a lot of, to go off of. We were young and we didn't have tons of other companies to look at and say, Oh, well, here's what they did. And they did it differently. It was kind of, well, I mean, everyone's encouraging us to raise this money. And I mean, we've been operating under the, uh, you know, under the assumption that this is the right thing to do. Like this was also five or six years ago when, you know, people would glorify fundraising, right? Like this was, this was kind of the thing. It still is a little bit like, I think we're getting better, but like people really glorified like, Oh, you made it, you know, you raised yep. that, um, you raised X million. So I think part of it was just the culture that we were in at the time. Um, we were young and we kind of just said, okay, well, I mean, this is the right thing to do. How old were you at the time you did the six raise? Um, well, when we did the, like our first raise where we got, uh, you know, the seat where the CEO ended up coming in afterwards, I was 21, 22. Okay. But did he, that, that was the 2 million or the 6 million? That was the 2 million. So oh, when we raised wow. Million, yeah. So right off the bat, like we were around for, you know, not even a year and we raised the 2 million and that's when they made the switch. Interesting. And what was revenue at that time monthly? Oh, geez. I can't Do you even remember? remember. I can't remember. It was like okay. sub 500 <laughs> a year. <laughs> so, sub 500 ARR? Like sub 500K a year. Yeah. 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 Okay. And again, you're at 500 a month today. Give me a sense of growth today. So take me back a year in July 2017. What were you doing per month? So, I mean, we grow, like, just to kind of make it on a broader sense, like, we probably grow 75% year over year now. And okay. That's mainly a factor of the space that we're in. So, you know, selling to EdTech, it's like large, like government sized contracts. And the other thing too, I say 20K is kind of our average, um, our average contract. But I mean, now a lot of the deals that we're filling our pipeline with are actually like 200,000, 250,000, like they're much larger, um, like undergraduate widespread contracts. So we're actually even moving away from our kind of 20K grad contracts to go after some of these bigger fish. That's great. So if you're growing 70, 75% year over year, that means about a year ago, you're maybe around 300, 350 grand. That's, I mean, that's healthy growth for a company this size. Yeah. And you'll be profitable in what month this year, you think? <laughs> um, well, I say, I keep saying this year as in like 12 months from now. So Got it. probably like, you know, 12 months. Yeah. <laughs> 12 months. <laughs> well, that, that's exciting. So, um, walk me, I, I'm, I'm going to imagine this number is going to be very low because you're signing three year deals. Churn is critical in any SaaS company. Tell me about your churn. We have negative 20% churn. Okay. So net negative 20%. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a huge net negative number. Walk me through, can you break that down in terms of, so expansion is X lost as X and then together it's net negative uh, 20. 
I'm not even going to try to go into those numbers, but what I will say is that, you know, we sell into clients and every year we are able to sell more products into them. Our upsell conversations are, you know, extremely easy and we build really strong relationships with our clients. You know, they sign these super long-term contracts and, you know, all I can say is every year we go back to them and say, Hey, you know, here's what's coming up for next year. Here are all the new features. And they say, great, sign us up. So yep. for us, like the land and expand is the model that we've chosen to pursue and it, in ed tech, it makes a lot of sense. Well, and it's working, you know, your expansion revenue has to be more than 20% of what you're churning. That's how you get to net negative 20%. So congratulations there. Tell me about CAC. When you do bring on a new customer, what are you paying to acquire that customer typically? Uh, we have a three to one uh, LTV to CAC. So, I mean, it's something that we've been working on because, you know, historically uh, kind of setting, you know, quotas for sales team when we were just going after 20 K deals was a little bit challenging because yep. um, you know, they're long sales cycles. So, I mean, you're doing a lot of work for a relatively small deal size. Um, so, you know, we started to improve our, our LTV to CAC once we started going after these, you know, bigger fish, which are more, yeah, like even at the graduate level, it's like fifty and sixty thousand dollar contracts, and at the undergraduate level, it's like two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollar contracts. Actually, at that point, it's actually going to be uh, better than than three to one. But three to one is kind of where we're at now. And what do you assume your lifetime value is? I know it's a dangerous number because it can go all over the place. But what do you assume? I mean, we barely lose customers. We've been around six years, so like when we do it in our numbers, like we assume a customer is, is five years. Mm -hmm. um, at twenty, at twenty grand a year. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. it's very realistic that it's even longer than that. Like even when we do all of our conservative projections, like we'll actually just say it's a three year and that's kind of how we get the three to one is actually just based on the three year lifetime value. But, um, like the reality is it's, it's five year today and it's probably longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're assuming that again, a minimum of three years at the 20 a year, that's 60 grand in lifetime value, which means you, you're totally comfortable paying 20 grand to acquire that customer. These are all very conservative yeah. numbers. Yeah. And what's the team size today? What do you got? We're at 20 people around the dot. Oh, very good. And where's everybody based? Uh, so we are mostly in Toronto and then we have uh, one in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, very good. Okay. Too good. Toronto is a good place to be. And um, in terms of payback period, anything you're trying to optimize for there? Uh, I mean, not really. <laughs> okay. I mean, usually that's a critical metric people are focusing on if they're trying to move towards profitability because you've got to get your payback. You've got to get your CAC back fairly quickly to make sure you don't have a big cash gap. I mean, we've always been pretty strong in that area. So like, it's something that, I mean, we try to improve on it, but like, there's no huge, like really the, for us, the, the biggest challenge in getting towards profitability, you know, moving from like a VC backed model to where we are now was just honestly managing our spend better and, yeah. you know, doing a better job, um, right sizing a lot of our old contracts. So when we went into, um, like when I first came back, we did a huge exercise going through literally every single account and saying, okay, they're actually only paying you know, 5,000 or 10,000. And that doesn't make any sense because our average is 20. You know, where did we go wrong there? And kind of going back at some of these discounted contracts that never should have been there in the first place, um, that kind of paired with just managing cash better. Like the, we've always had a pretty strong payback uh, period. Yeah. You also, I, I forgot this too. You're, you're doing all annual plans. So the cash is coming immediately. So you probably well, get yeah. it back. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Like I mean, really what we're just concerned about is that when we invoice them, they pay in 30 days. <laughs> yep. Very good, Emily. All right. Let's wrap up here with the famous five quick answers. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh God. How is that a quick question? <laughs> well, the one you, you name the book. Um, okay. What's my favorite business book? Um, I mean, I don't know. Outliers, which is super common, but good book. no problem. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying currently? Uh, I am a big fan of Emily Chang right now. I know she's not a CEO per se, but uh, she's got a lot of good things to say. Num number three, what's your favorite online tool for building a business? Salesforce. <laughs> no, and number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Oh, eight and a half. I'm, super, I'm huge on sleep. That's great. And what's your situation? If you don't mind me asking, married, single, do you have kids? Uh, I am in a relationship, <laughs> no so not, kids, not married, no kids, not married, no kids and uh, no plans anytime soon. And Emily, do you mind me asking how old you are? I just turned 28, 28. Very good. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Ooh, never to raise VC money. I would have bootstrapped this from the start. 
Guys, there you have it. Sometimes it makes sense to bootstrap again, doing well, the right sizing the business. Kira Talent, again, really serving universities directly, making the admissions process more fair, more holistic, easier for students to apply, especially with things like video essays, which is their brother and brother. Founded in 2012, team of 20 people, uh, all based mainly in Toronto, have about 300 universities. They're working with mostly brick and mortar, uh, doing now about 500 grand per month in revenue. That's up 75% year over year, which is obviously healthy. They raised 8 million bucks, net negative 20%. 20% in terms of revenue churn annually. Super healthy numbers. Emily, thank you for taking us to the top. Great. Thank you so much.